If we look at what the global economy consists of today, the big ticket items, the things that most people spend most of their money on, are determined by how long those people expect to live. Things like, you know, life insurance, health insurance, inheritance arrangements, you know, pension plans. <clears throat> and um, at the moment, pretty much everybody expects to live only a few years longer than their parents did. Now, what's going to happen when this sea change caused by experiments like the ones we're doing at LEV Foundation succeed, when those experiments succeed, what's going to happen is people are going to go overnight from thinking that into thinking, so long as they're below the age of, let's say, 60 or 70 at that time, um, that they're probably going to live indefinitely. And that changes everything. And, you know, the insurance companies and the pension funds and so on are totally not ready for that. I've been out there for the past several years telling people this. You know, when I get invited to speak at companies like that, I'll, um, you know, I'll give talks with titles like Anticipate the Anticipation. And, you know, and I explain all this. And everyone's terribly courteous, but you can tell that the following day they're going to come in to work and, you know, it was all a bad dream and they get on to do what they were doing anyway. It's very depressing. You know, I, I was also thinking about personal relationships. You know, imagine, you know, when people now live for, I don't know, centuries or whatever. How might this change personal relationships? Love, yeah. parenting, friendships? Well, so there's a few things to that. First of all, friendships and indeed intergenerational, intergenerational relationships within a family. You know, we have this huge stratification at the, at the cultural level. You know, people even 10 years apart, let alone 40 years apart, just tend not to listen to the same music, right? Now, it very well may be that that's because people in general who are, you know, in their 60s or 70s cannot keep up with their granddaughters on the dance floor. And if they could, <laughs> you know, things would be might be considerably different. Um then, you know, people often talk about marriage, you know, and till, till death do us part and so on. You know, that's a rather idiotic one to talk about because we've already got a huge change in terms of, like, uh, how many relationships actually last, or, you know, lifelong, um, that has resulted just from the modest increase in longevity that we've seen over the past 50 years, shall we say. Um, so, um, you know, that's obviously a problem that, you know, we already seem to be able to accommodate. Um, you know, there may be other changes. Of course, one change that we may see, which we certainly do see across society already, is a reduction in how many kids people have. Um, you might think, well, oh dear, when people live indefinitely, and especially when there's no menopause anymore, or when you can turn menopause on and off, which is likely to be the way we do it, um, then uh, women are going to be able to have much many more kids, right? Um, but we have to remember that when any society goes through its demographic transition into you know women having more emancipation and education and prosperity, um, they tend to have many fewer kids, but also they tend to have them later. Uh, you know, they've got choices of what to do with their lives before they do this terribly time-consuming thing. And they only have them a little bit later, but that's because we have menopause now, so they're only able to have them a little bit later or not have them at all. And when that's no longer the case, it seems pretty much nailed on that the average woman is going for those same reasons to um, you know, to postpone having their first kid for another decade and another decade because they can, right? Um, uh, so actually, I perceive that the fertility rate is going to go down as a result of uh, when measured as number of babies born per calendar year worldwide, as opposed to, you know, number of babies that a given woman has during their entire life because we don't know the answer to that because we don't know what, how long that entire life is going to be um uh yeah so yeah it, it, that's again uh, counterintuitive but pretty obvious when you think it through and what can i do today i mean what, what are some of the scientifically proven and maybe the most effective methods to reverse the damage that i've done to my body so at the moment, we've basically got nothing that reverses damage. We've we've got things that look a bit like reversing damage, but what they are are repairing things that are not damaged by my definition. My definition of damage is irreversible. 
like the body does not have systems that know how to repair it. But there are, but the creation of of, of those kinds of molecular and cellular change, uh, it, 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 it's, all, it's almost always a multi-step process, and the intermediate steps are repairable. It's just the body doesn't do it, doesn't do a proper job, doesn't do a complete job in repairing those intermediates. So some of them get through to the point where there's no repair possible. So, um, what can one? The question really is, what can one do to enhance the performance of those repair processes that repair pre-damage? Let's call it pre-damage, right? And <clears throat> of course, there are things you can do, but there are things you already know. You know, don't smoke, don't get seriously overweight. You know, eat a reasonably varied diet. Over and above that, there's essentially nothing. There's, it's like <clears throat> you, you you might be able to get a few months, maybe a year, if you're lucky. More than no, worse than that, it's different things for different people. The subtle differences between different people's metabolism turn out to matter a lot in terms of what one needs to deal with. So, um, for example, um, there's a vitamin called vitamin B12, which is important for various um, uh, uh, for, for various aspects of metabolism. And I, t- I, per- I turn out to have a slightly low level of vitamin B12. And in particular, the result of that is that I have a rather high level of uh, something you're not supposed to have a high level of called homocysteine. Now, it seems that I'm sufficiently well built that that high level of homocysteine isn't doing me any harm yet, but it's still a bit of a, you know, a, a, a red flag. So I'd like to do something about this. And it turns out that you have to look at the details. Um, if I take vitamin B12 the, uh, as a supplement, it's not necessarily going to help to lower my homocysteine. Why not? Because there are various different subtypes of vitamin B12, and uh, you have to take the right one in order to um, have the right effect. The reason, I, the, the genetic reason why I have this particular metabolic um, peculiarity is because of I, I've got a, an inefficient copy of one particular gene and that means that i have to take a particular type of vitamin b12 in order to have an effect on my homocysteine if i take the type that you can get most easily it won't work you know so you know these are really um subtle subtle things to learn what this adds up to if i can make any kind of general statement is number one Pay attention to your body. Insofar as you're maybe experimenting with different diets, different supplements, you know, just see what works. Don't read books because you are the only book that matters. Number two, measure as much as you can. Find out as much as you can about what your body really is at the level of, you know, concentrations of things in your blood and so on. And, of course, your genome. You can get your genome sequenced for $1,000 these days, you know. So, um, you know, that's how to find out things like what I just mentioned about myself. These things are valuable. They will really help you to optimize. But, again, I come back to the first point I made. Even if you absolutely optimize for yourself, you won't get more than a year or two of additional healthy life. The only way, therefore, to improve your chances of um, living longer is to hasten the arrival of interventions that don't yet exist so that, you have, you know, that, so that they come along in time for you. And, of course, different people have different ways of doing that. If you happen to uh, be very wealthy or even not so wealthy, then you can always support this work financially. If you happen to have a podcast, you can get interview me and educate your audience. If you happen to be a biologist, you can choose which particular field of biology to work on so as to be most impactful. Everybody can do advocacy in one way or another. You can talk to your fa- friends, your family, your colleagues. One thing I like to say to people when they when I talk about donations is they'll say, oh, I've hardly got any money, you know, I won't make any kind of difference. And I always point out that, you know, first of all, every dollar counts, but secondly, the less wealthy you are, the more people you know who are wealthier than you. So that's where advocacy comes in. You know, it's funny, we're measuring basically everything in our life. We're measuring the bank account, we're measuring goals in our business, in our professional life, we measure all that stuff, but we don't measure our body and uh, things that's things that's going on now, which is probably should be the most obvious thing to do. Um, but most of us do it. You see, I mean, a lot of it is because people don't want to know in the same way that, you know, diagnosis of actual diseases 
um, you know, and the reason people don't want to know is because they have given up. It's, it's kind of reasonable not to want to know about something that is going to be bad news and you can't do anything about it. You know, you might as well just at least live in blissful ignorance for as long as you can. But of course, the validity of that logic changes over time as we expand the number of things that we can do to improve things. So, you know, um, you know, lots of cancers, for example, are much more survivable now than they were even 20 years ago. Cardiovascular disease, similarly, and so on. And, um, you know, these are, things that, these are reasons why one really should err on the side of biting the bullet and finding things out, even if there are things that one didn't want to know. And what about sleep? Because there is, you know, there is this hustle culture, of course. Uh, um, it, it might be changing um, in the recent years, but, you know, um, me, myself, yeah, I, I come from a from a time where hustle culture is really the thing, right? You uh, basically, you know, the, the less you sleep, the cooler you are, the most productive you are, and the more, um, you know, people look at you and say, oh, wow, you're so busy, that's great. Mm -hmm. What about sleep in all of this? Yeah, so thank you for bringing this up. Sleep is incredibly important. Um, you know, sleep is the time when your brain figures out how to store, how to, how to learn from the experiences of the day. <coughs> and much more than that, you know, at the biochemical level, lots and lots of things happen when you're asleep, when your metabolism is somewhat depressed, um, that are, you know, absolutely essential to minimizing the rate of accumulation of damage.